Valery Soloviev is a Russian political scientist, historian, and former head of the Public Relations Department at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, Dimgimo. He resigned from Dimgimo on June 19, 2019, after being requested by the university administration. He was forced out from his position for his political views and the opposition to Putin's regime. Three times he was arrested for participation in peaceful protests as part of the Perimen Changes movement that he founded in October 2020. On September 22, 2022, the Minister of Justice of Russia declared Valery Soloviev a foreign agent. Valery Soloviev gave this interview to former journalists of the Echo of Moscow radio station, which used to be one of the very few that spoke the truth and gave a place to a variety of opinions. After the radio station was shut down by the authorities, its journalists revived its work on the YouTube with few channels run by different hosts. Zhvoi Gvost is one of them. This interview was recorded on October 23, 2022. Good morning, Irina. Good morning, Maxim. Glad to see you. Valery, I'm very happy to see you. We saw each other this week at the Build channel. And after that, a new photograph showed up where we can see a bruise on Putin's hand. And after that, we realized that we need to see you again together with Irina and speak about what happened to Putin's hand. I can tell you what happened. It was the hand of his body double at the shooting range. It wasn't the president. It was his body double with the security team of the president that usually escorts the president. That's why his manners and his behavioral pattern was a bit different from the original. How can you differentiate them? Yes. I'm not such a great expert, and I have to listen to the opinion of more competent people who are within the system. But why? What about the voice? The voice was the same. The voice can be copied as well. This double that we saw, it is so good that it is absolutely identical. As they call it, they enhanced him. And it works very well. They used the double once already, in May of this year, when the president visited a military hospital in Moscow. It wasn't the president of the Russian Federation, it was a person who was presenting himself as a president. I know it sounds like a fictional story, but that's the reality. They use doubles quite often. The president doesn't play hockey and doesn't swim anymore. They use more healthy people for this. He physically can't do it, or it's just security reasons. Both. But mainly he has some physical limitations. But why then uh, they made this purge at the range? Because they had to take the same special security measures as if the president was visiting the range himself. If they did it differently, then there would be grounds for the public to doubt that was a president. Well, it sounds creepy, frankly speaking. But just like anything else in Russia, could you imagine a year ago that we would be in such a situation as now? When I told you that we will be in this situation, you said, no, it's crazy fantasy, it cannot happen. Oh, you know, every time when I recall this show, I remember it was in December and Valery Soloviev said to us that somewhere in February or March there will be a war with Ukraine. And back then I thought it's impossible. But then in April and March I said there will be a draft, and possibly in the fall. And at the beginning of October I told you that it's quite possible that they will use nuclear weapons, sadly. Let's take a vote about the double. Let's ask the audience if they can assume uh, that sometimes Putin's body double is used. Or this version is a bit too creepy. Let's just write it down like this. It's it's way too creepy. Let's let's see what the audience thinks about it. 
but back to the visit, the visit to the uh, shooting range. Uh, they said it was the president, but why they had to do that? Why they had to show that Putin can shoot a sniper's rifle? Well, they had to do it because, you know, we have special military operation. Did you see uh, the Russian president at the front line? We saw the Ukrainian president at the front line, right, but we didn't see the Russian one. And it seems that mobilization uh, is happening to everyone and the country is turning into a ca military camp, but the president is the only one who is not involved. He doesn't have anything to do with it directly. And here he is. He shows up like Stalin showed up, I think, uh, at the Western Front uh, during World War II. But he didn't really show up there. More or less, its analogy is the same. And here we have the president who shows up. They gave him the old rifle. And before giving it to him, uh, they prepared it. And here we have the president as a dashing commander-in-chief sets an example, inspires the drafted soldiers and says that everything is fine. But you understand whom they uh, counting for. But it's not for the fools, right? It is for the people who consume information through the official channels. And at least half of the Russians, they do that. And they get the proof that the president knows everything, he keeps everything under control. But if anything goes wrong, this is because of the enemies, this is the bad governors and uh, weak authorities. You see how well he is shooting, uh, he could have hit a fly on the fly. And the propaganda people would say that he hit fly's eye. It looks exactly like what they do with the Belarus president, uh, the same thing. Yes, right. You know, PR people, they kind of don't want to work anymore. They know uh, they can show anything and people will eat it anyway. Maybe you saw this video, Valery. It was about the drafted people who are arguing with those who, who are drafting them and they say, you're lying to us, you didn't give us anything, you didn't equip us, so we don't know how to feed our families. But if even they're not rebelling, if, if they're not protesting and how they're drafted and they see that they don't have anything, don't they understand uh, when they see such videos, such, such shows, uh, how well everything is going? What about these people who are uh, unhappy with this? What feelings they will have? Well, you see, maybe they don't uh, count for the mobilized people. Uh, maybe they don't care about it. Maybe they think that this uh, mobilized people will think that uh, where we are, things are bad, but somewhere else things are fine and everything is organized. But on the other hand, the authorities just don't give a damn about it. They know that these soldiers are obedient, they don't protest, they don't attack their commanders. That's fine. When they will attack their commanders, then the authorities will come up with some measures to stop them. But you see such shows, uh, they actually instigate such moods. Well, here we are thinking hypothetically. Such shows supposed to generate more tension. But it, it doesn't matter if it's just generating tension. It would, would it important uh, that this tension is released and something happens, uh, like we know that they burn enlistment offices across the country, and we know this practice and has been spread across the country. When somebody is killing uh, soldiers at the shooting range, we know it happens locally and we can assume that such things are possible because the circumstances are like this. But if the drafted people uh, will be protesting and not just screaming and saying you didn't give us uniform and ammo and equipment, they will be asking instead what are we doing here, what's happening and let's just not go there or we will take uh, the weapons and go against 
those who are drafting us against the authorities, like it happened in 1917 in Russia. So if that happens, but I don't think it's going to happen now, maybe next year. But what's important to know what these moods are pushing people to, what actions people are going to undertake, and what's important if these actions are local or not. If it's just shooting in the air and screaming, then it's nothing. But if actions, then it means something. But right now what we see, there is no such a force that will give us an example for actions. Uh, neither in Russia nor in the West, in, in abroad. But nevertheless, uh, Valery, shooting and many other things, kind of new stage. And Kiryenka, the head of presidential administration, says that we need to turn this war into the people's war. May we say that we at a new phase of this whole state of the country? Yes, Maxim, it's a good question, properly worded. The country is turning into a military camp and 40 percent of the economy more or less uh, works on the special military operation they're creating a parallel uh, framework of governance uh, and this is the coordination council and the defense emergency will be spread across the country and they will introduce it uh, i mean the defense emergency in moscow after the new years with all the goodies so to speak no human rights censorship they will be able to put anybody to jail for 30 days without any explanations. And they can confiscate anything from people. Uh, they can appropriate it for the needs of the front, particularly SUVs. I think those will be in great demand for the army. Yes, it's a different state, but I wouldn't say it's people's war, because I always remember this Tolstoy's words, the cudgel of people's war. If they raise this cudgel, it's hard to say whom this cudgel is going to hit. I would say that this is an attempt to begin a total war. A bit different wording, I would say, that is more appropriate for today's situation more appropriate than Kiryenko used. What's the difference? Well, you see, the difference is that in total war you cannot have any people's enthusiasm. The system kind of forces you to do this. So it's kind of direct obedience, right? Yes, without any enthusiasm. And those people who were drafted that you mentioned, they have no enthusiasm. They have no any fit of patri patriotism. It's like, they need us, we'll go. It's a bit different attitude. And we can extrapolate it on uh, the attitude in business, in the administration of the president. They can imitate uh, the work, uh, but they know what's happening. They know it is catastrophe. It's a governance catastrophe, economic catastrophe, moral catastrophe, and psychological catastrophe. It will end up with a big political catastrophe, but everybody is sort of bewitched. They think they're going to dodge the bullet, and maybe genius of the leader will find a genius solution. But after New Year's, uh, the mood may be different. They will say, you know, everything is burning, whatever, we don't care anymore. We'll, we'll have to save ourselves individually. Valery, how are we going to survive? We'll survive as we used to do before. If uh, they're not going to question our existence at all, so we will survive. Just imagine, you know, after those 30 years that we already experienced, and now we encounter this, and we're thrown back to the past, far back to the past. And I talk to people whom I know who lived during the Soviet time, and they tell me that never happened like that during the Soviet time. I mean, those Soviet crazy things that they had, but they cannot be compared with what's happening now. Now we have madness and violence, and they, they're raping people's brain. I can see that these neural nets of people are completely destroyed. 
and how we see the situation and describe it, we can actually see what's happening. And this catastrophe of everything that we observe, before that there was intellectual catastrophe, the authorities, they achieved what they wanted, they turned people off from common sense. I think 1.2 million left Russia after September 20, 21st. Uh, whose ideology was that? Surkov's ideology? Well, Surkov, he created a framework of this. He kind of told the people that do whatever you want, you know, do your business, mind your own business, don't snoop into politics, be entertained by TV and anything else. Everything should be working on entertainment. And it turned out that many people have a shorter memory span than a goldfish. The goldfish has a memory span 12 minutes, but our people now have the memory span from one little video to another. Yes, they achieved what they wanted in the authorities. It's easier to rule people under this influence. Everything is decided for the people, somebody thinks for the people, and now they came for people's lives. They came for their husbands, sons, daughters, and mothers very soon, because they are planning to enlist tens of thousands of women and medical personnel. More than 5,000 people were voting. And 73%, they actually assume that a body double is possible for such events. But 27%, uh, they think it's uh, way too much. But, you know, 73% for it and 27 ag against that. So, see, that's why I'm explaining all this. And life proves that I'm right. Valery, back to the defense emergency and all the goodies, as you said. Maybe the authorities will need a Russian aluminum company or a Norilsk nickel company for the war purposes. Of course they will need that, because uh, they need to get real stuff for their war. And as you know, they started with Lukoil company. All the management left the country. Only one of top managers died under very strange circumstances. They started with Luke Oil. Luke Oil will become a part of a big oil company in Russia, and some other companies may experience the same. But the thing is, the authorities don't have enough time for that. They can't just simply say that three commissioners wore leather jackets who come and show their mandate and they say so we have rights for your property and everything will be serving Russian people and we are representatives of the people no I think they wanted to do that but I don't think they have enough time for that but are people unhappy with all of this people of uh, like Deribaska Everybody is unhappy with what's happening. But they clearly understand that they cannot do anything. That's why they see this meaninglessness and fruitlessness of uh, everything. So, and they cannot conspire against that. Because if they try to speak about confronting this, they will be taken away to a dungeon where they'll be tortured and worked on. And the elites know that, but Siloviki and security services, they know they're going to get the power anyway. They majorly have it now, but soon formally they'll have it in full. Everything is kind of flowing into their hands. And then they think, uh, then we'll deal with Lukoil company, with Nornikel, and whatever else comes. Why to rush it? Everything is just going to us. The situation is unfolding in our favor. We will catch all the fish. Remember that phrase, we'll turn imperialistic war into civil war. Political scientist Galamov, he supposed that those who want to dethrone the power, uh, they will be 
They will be destroyed because Putin can turn it in his favor. If he can't win on the outer front, he can turn it into the country and fight it here. Can it work like this? I think it's uh, too difficult and too risky of a scheme. Because legitimacy of Putin in the eyes of the elite is undermined anyway. And the more he is moving towards trying to win, this reputation uh, will be destroyed even more. Because nobody in the, in the elites wants to sacrifice their lives. They are not sacrificing just their assets. There will be a risk in their life. But all of this may happen without any particular efforts on part of Putin and others. This is how the situation just unfolding. Because if they say in the Kremlin that it's possible that the events will be turned into a civil war, what is Evgeny Prigozhin with his private military company is getting ready, or Ramzan Kadyrov in Chechnya getting ready for? They're getting ready for this particular variant when uh, there will be chaos in the country. It's not going to be a civil war in this classical sense. Uh, it, it will be chaos, because civil war needs ideology. We can see some forces that can communicate some ideology to people, those that can inspire people. We don't see anything like that. And I think uh, the last ideological group of the country, this turbo patriot so-called, I think they will join uh, Prigozhin with his private military company. And the other groups, they will be creating so-called polycentric society. There will be many centers. And we poor citizens will go to stores, buy food, there will be food, and when living in the suburbs, we will learn that somewhere there in the center there was a shooting or skirmishes, they are going to rush in somebody's apartment uh, and they appropriated that apartment because they needed headquarters for whatever reasons they need. They show the paper that shows that, you know, rights are now theirs. They can they kick out the tenants of the apartment and the owners of the apartment. Well, actually, you know what? It happened before, during the uh, 1917, uh, when they were coming to different businesses, were appropriating them, like in Orenburg, there was this American uh, hotel that they appropriated. And actually, by now, uh, there is a KGB office in this hotel still. You see, recently we see, we can see that Russia is a country of this crazy fantasy that came true, and these things are quite possible. Uh, I don't want to say that they will necessarily happen, and we never dream about it, and, you know, sane people wouldn't wish for that. But I have to tell you, the Commander-in-Chief, the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, he paved the road to this situation. How can you have a people's war in that? What people can fight for in this situation? For their property? Well, if they have it, they will be happy because they won't have anything and they will think, we have nothing and you'll have nothing. All those people who live in uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg and all, all those who live in big cities. And you know, by the way, that the, the best brothel in the country was taken over by the Communist Party. Well, you know, it's like in one of those fictional novels. Valery, I just suppose that you spoke about what I'm going to ask you with uh, Maxim last week. But since I didn't talk to you this week, I would like to ask you, uh, this defense emergency without declaring defense emergency and delegating powers as it happened during COVID times, is it an effective measure, as Putin might think? Or it's like I'm going to drag everybody down so that nobody, that everybody will be involved? It's both, actually. If you're talking about totality, they engage everybody. Not at once, but gradually. It's like they're cutting the tail piece by piece. First, they introduce 
defense emergency in one region then in in the other region and then after the new year they were introduced in moscow and then he thinks that it's a very effective measure as a disciplinary measure because they're afraid of unrest they're afraid of protests that's why they say let's declare everybody who is protesting let's declare them enemies of the country enemies of the people and of course behind those enemies uh, there are these foreign agents who are pushing them and of course you can shoot at them or behead them in advance because they're lying to people and we know those liars we know who they are who are trying to provoke unrest and they will probably recall 1917 or something else and many more historical parallels mechanism is ready but how it's going to work just imagine in order to keep curfew as it was during the pandemic when the curfew was introduced they need a lot of observers and some of those observers will be sent to the front I mean Russian guard police and when they return they're not going to be as enthusiastic it's just obvious to use the military force as they thought they might do during the pandemic to block Moscow using reliable troops in 2020 I don't think it's going to be possible today because they don't have resources for that they exhausted resources well they'll have people on duty for that they'll sign them oh yes right uh, those on duty people with baseball bats this is how I actually imagine this well anything is possible I have to tell you this anything is possible but I think in general the whole system will be shattered and will be falling apart because when the authorities are using these extreme measures they actually admit that other measures are not efficient enough and uh, they cannot use them anymore Valeria, I was very much impressed uh, with uh, Richard III's show. Where did you see it? No, I saw it, just imagine, I saw this show in Orenburg Theatre, and it was directed uh, by one of those uh, president's people who supported the president, and you watch Richard III and you understand that it's uh, the play is about today and then we were talking with you about theater as you remember and what they did they started to remove the names of the playwrights from the posters those playwrights that left the country what about this intelligentsia who these intellectuals they have to understand what's happening they have to see the parallels what function they will play well so far they will be adjusting some of them will be fleeing and some of them will be adjusting adjusting meaning they will be silent or exchanging their opinions in the social media they cannot produce ideology they cannot be an organizing force a driving force they can't either within the country or without the country they can try to participate in the conflict when there will be disintegration of the elites and part of the elites will turn to the intellectuals to intelligentsia will turn to the middle class of the cities through the opinion leaders through those who are still free who are still not in jail and by the way you may become such a channel of communication because uh, they will be deciding on who is going to take the power next year that's that's, that's going to be a question that they will be asking and the middle class of the cities will be participating in this those that have principles and values and intellectuals usually have that and I think it would be right I would say they're politically active asset Valery, when we see something happening in some territories of Russia and then it it is spread across Russia this is how it happened in Chechnya the same is happening in just in newly annexed territories so what can be forecast looking at this some of the examples that we saw in those republics today that we can expect uh, in this in the streets of other cities 
I, I'm not sure that we can't project anything, because to create a regional army can be founded only by one person, and only one person can organize a private army. Regional groups or regional regiments, vol volunteer regiments, they will be uh, founded only when the central authority cannot rule the country anymore. And that should be a consolidated decision. Governors cannot make decision because uh, they are weak, and sometimes they even are brought to those regions, and sometimes they are not even uh, rooted in the uh, local elites, in regional elites. And they might be making some decision to control situation and to keep the order. And maybe it's not going to be the worst uh, solutions, the worst decisions that they make. They will be interested in keeping order. And I don't mean uh, the police order, uh, but I mean social order, because uh, the attempts to oppress people uh, will be counterproductive. There will be nobody who will be able to oppress civilians. Uh, they will have to make agreements to make compromises, and in such a way we'll be creating a federation based on agreements. And it will look uh, like the situation in 1990s. It would be great, actually. It wouldn't be uh, too bad. Valery, you said that this pro-war party, they will be joining uh, Prigozhin and his private military company. Your colleagues, philosophers, philologists, uh, PR people who probably sincerely believe in this, aren't they appalled by such people as Prigozhin? Well, a big feature of Russian intellectuals, they are very flexible, uh, they can rationalize things. Well, they say to themselves that Evgeny Prigozhin is an instrument of history, and they would say, imagine what it was before, and immediately they'll have a whole number of cases, historical cases, from our history and history of other countries, and they may think, well, that's what we are doomed to, so nothing to be appalled with, after everything that we went through. I don't think people are not appalled with anything. I mean, on the group level, but on the personal level, people are very much appalled with this and they won't go for any compromises or alliances with this. It's just absolutely unacceptable. They might be afraid of this. And fear would be a holding factor. And then I think we will have an example of official propaganda people whose life will be extremely inconvenient. I would say it would take a very unexpected turn. So this is quite possible. Valery, if we look at this flank, Russian marches, uh, marches of Russian nationalists were uh, manifesting those ideas of empire and nationalists. But if you think about it, this uh, empire and nationalists, uh, these, are, these two things can go together. But what about these people? These people are more nationalists or they're imperialists? They are monomaniacs. They have only one idea. If we don't win the war now, then everything ends. Well, in fact, no. Only after that we will have a real resurrection. But they are monomaniacs. No imperial ideas. They just want to destroy Ukraine. If they had all the possible explosives, uh, they would ex destroy all this. They are cannibals. It's not a matter of values, it's a matter of uh, being cannibals, and they are cannibals, and we didn't notice this. And now all this being exposed. And now the litmus paper is you know, how they look at violence, and look at them. Uh, they, they scream, kill more, more and more, otherwise we're not going to live. But nobody questions their life. They have nothing to be afraid of. Well, sorry, it's very hard to be not so emotional when things happen like this. Well, yes, you're right, Valery. Well, sometimes when you look at them and they say, oh, we'll be, uh, they say, we'll be killed if uh, we don't win. Is it a fantasy? No, it's not a fantasy. 
The more they're trying, uh, the more the chance of this happening is. They're winding themselves up. This, this, it is standard rationalization. Uh, just imagine, you know, they make one step, then another step, and they have nothing left. And they can only say this phrase of famous uh, philosophy doctor. So we were walking together, we'll be hanging together. And I think they understand it very well. And that's why they're so hysterical about destroying Ukrainianism and Ukraine. Because they think if they destroy it, they will survive. But it's not going to happen like this. Valery, what about the people who are about 20 or 25 years old? They're growing in this atmosphere. They're saturated with all of it. And they are a generation that is growing during the war. What to expect from them? What consequences we are to expect? We can only see what happens only after it ends, how intensively it's going to be unfolding and what, what outcomes we will have. But all this is unpredictable. We don't have anything to see what the outcomes could be. What we do now, we use historical analogies uh, when we analyze the situation. But the situation can be so unique that we will have no point of reference. Valeria, I'm asking you because many people who watch this, they have children and grandchildren and they have to talk to, to the kids about what's happening. How to explain it to children? I don't know if you talk to children at all or with teenagers, but I have a daughter and I'm trying to talk to her. And I see that it's very difficult. Yes, it's very difficult because it's very hard for us to understand what's happening. So that's why... My principle is, be true, explain it as you understand it. Of course, you may avoid certain uh, stories and certain words, but better to speak the truth, adjusting it to a certain age of the kids. But they'll go to school with this truth, and what consequences will be? Well, Maxim, you need to warn them, you need to tell them that so this thing we discuss at home, drinking good old ale, so if it's like my son, who is taller than I am, or with a cup of tea or Coca-Cola, or some other beverage. This is what you can say at home and this is what you cannot say at school. Kids, they are very understanding and uh, even in the first grade you already under understand. So don't underestimate them. You have to be very sincere and open with them to the degree it's possible and explain it to them in the language that they will understand. And a lot depends on the family. If in your family you discuss some social or political events, say level of social, social socialization is pretty high, then it's easier to talk to such kids. In other families explanations will be different. They will be receiving the information from TV. Many times I saw that people who are not stupid uh, quite smart, but nevertheless they repeat everything they heard on TV and they kind of say, well, we heard on TV. And so this is like a bulletproof argument for them if it was from TV. So that's why, Maxim, do what you think you can do. But at the same time, Valery, this is a generation of Internet. Well, you see, but they don't care. Remember like in Bulgakov's novel Master and Margaret, when they say, uh, we, we knew those lovers who didn't notice that a civil war was outside the window. They're not those lovers, they're children of the Internet, but they can easily skip the whole thing. Now I'll make it more complicated, Valeri. If we look at the polls, uh, people who are 60 plus, they're pro-war, they want to continue with the war. And then the question is, how did it happen? Those people who grew up with the memory about World War II, 
and they knew how bad the war was, why they're so bloodthirsty, and how to talk to these people. Maxim, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'll tell you directly. They're not going to be drafted. And when you're not drafted for yourself, you can look fearless and can demand whatever you want. You can say, so sons and go and fight for the motherland, die for the motherland. They should be offered to prove their choice with their own actions. You can tell them, go to the enlistment office and go to the war. Let them say, I'll go for, for the son. I am who was trained with the movies of war, I'll go to the war. And I also have this regiment of pensioners that will go with me to the war, they may say. So, in other words, your answer to those people should be just one, kind of say to them, if you like it, go, go to the trenches, get the rifle and go fight, show, set an example. That's just the only way, only shock therapy for them. Ideology and arguments and all this are unnecessary, because these people can be brought to their senses only by the cudgel of the people's war, that Leo Tolstoy mentioned. And in this case, you know, Sergei Kiryanka, the head of presidential administration, mentioned it. Okay, fine, fine, you can continue. Well, you see, as soon as I hear this name Kiryanka, I immediately have this urge. But you know, uh, he, he speaks like this, but he used to be a liberal, he used to be a Democrat, he used to be a part and a founder of uh, Soyuz Pravich Sil Party, the Union of Right Forces. Who is dealing with ideology today? Who is Goebbels in Russia today? Well, I would tell you this, we don't have somebody like Goebbels, uh, but uh, these things are already known, but uh, Sergei Kiryanka, he's the main ideologist, he's extremely smart, he can build complex combinations, he can look far ahead, that's why he is making such a career. Did Kiryanka replace Surkov? No, I don't think it happened that simply. I think that his influence is much stronger than Surkov. And Surkov actually liked to play this Byron-like hero, like I am this dark demon of these places, and I can write plays, and I can do this and that, Surkov would have thought. He's like a Machia Machiavellian type, a talent of the Renaissance time. But at least he worked with young people, but Kiryanka doesn't. Wait a second, Kiryanka works uh, with young people, all those competitions like leaders of Russia, future of Russia and all this, he works with young people, uh, all those uh, camps for, for use, uh, like serious. You can't really see it as obvious as you used to see it before, it's like Nasha movement, when these young people would go to Moscow, they get it at the Red Square and all that. He doesn't need it anymore. If we are talking about young people, we shouldn't be overestimating uh, the influence and meaning. Uh, they're less interested in uh, politics, much less than older people, they're not as active, uh, young people are frustrated, those who can still think, they don't understand what to do, it's not that they don't understand what's happening, but they see that their life is under threat, not existentially, but socially, and they don't know what to do. Valery, anti-tank pyramids that you can see in Belgrade region, it's symbol of what? To prepare for what? What uh, the military forces are getting ready? They're getting ready to lose some of the regions they occupied, but not the new ones, like Kherson region or some territories of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. But I think more. I think that uh, Ukrainian military forces, if they're successful, they're not going to move too far forward, but they may go to the Russian territory, and I think it's possible. But why would they do this? Is like symbolically they would do this? 
I think, yes, there can be some sort of symbol in that. They need to show their power, what they can do. It's a territory, we come here, territory of our enemy, we kind of marked it, and we can leave. But that could be quite a risky symbolism, because it's quite a good ground for Russia to use tactical nuclear weapon. They're not going to think too much, too long. But, Valery, you can see that uh, they blame each other for preparing provocation. Uh, so how do you look at it? What, do you, what is your take on it? I read this news, but I'm not interested in this disinformation war. I'm interested in practical results. I know that catastrophe is very possible, human-made catastrophe, uh, with destroying dams and bridges over the Dnieper River. People may die and some infrastructure will be destroyed. I'm talking about probability. So, in other words, we need to get ready for this, right? Yes, sadly. Do you remember this Chekhovian phrase that when they say, if they speak too much about it, it means that they're preparing people for this. They're preparing people that uh, there will be this radioactive cloud, it will be drifting, but it's not too powerful, just less than one kiloton. Or they will use tactical nuclear weapons. This is what Soviet in the Soviet time, uh, they were preparing to make terrorist attacks in some countries. They know these things exist, it can be used, they using this war, they are using all this news to prepare people for this. Just imagine, six months ago we were resisting all this, and now we are discussing it as if it's, it's okay. And people are getting used to it too. What it does, it kind of lowers the threshold, pain threshold. I'm not saying that those things will be used for sure, but I'm very much afraid that everything is ready for that. The main thing is internal prepared, preparedness of people that might think that they can't do without it. And this is the argument that they need to use in order to win. In other words, they can't win without it, yes. Well, at least not to lose. I think uh, the stakes are a bit different now, as they say it in, in the Kremlin, so we can't win, but we cannot lose either. May I ask you a question as a professor of um, Gimo? Uh, yes, a former professor of Gimo. There are no such thing as former professor. No, there is. I would like to ask you about international agenda. We have nine minutes left. Re-election of Xi Jinping and the UK events. In Russia, this news are uh, like a background news, like a daily news. It's like that because they think it's not going to impact anything. Well, right now, I don't think uh, re-election of Xi Jinping may influence anything. I don't think it will change anything in uh, Russo-Chinese relations. The events in the UK, of course, in the in the Kremlin, the Russians uh, were very happy that Lee Strauss failed so much. They are very happy about it. But the question is, who is going to replace her? They might think, God forbid, it's going to be Boris Johnson again, and maybe Lee Strauss would uh, stay. Well, this is what things depend on. But in any case, uh, any chaos in Europe is good for Kremlin, because it impedes decision-making in Europe. If uh, Democrats will lose, that's good, because it's easier to make agreements with Republicans. They, win, they may limit support for Ukraine. But right now all these things are just hypothetical. But don't you think we had some uh, polls that were saying that Democrats will lose in November election? 
those polls that you can see in Russian media, with all due respect to the source, I would be quite cautious trusting it. Because in the United States, surprisingly, their election is quite unpredictable. How can they live in such a country if they don't know who's going to win in the election? That's just uh, amazing. So that, but that's a fact, and we have to count on it. I remember Liz Truss, Valeri, and when she was a Minister of Foreign Affairs, and she, when she came to Russia, and when she made a mistake or got confused, and when she said that Belgrade and Voronezh regions should be part of Ukraine. And maybe she is right, you know, uh, uh, those inherently Russian territories she assigned to Ukraine. But you see, then we will be saying, yes, so Lee Strauss was right. But today it doesn't, doesn't look as funny. No, it's not funny at all. We're actually laughing to keep our sanity. It's like a therapeutic effect. Continuing this international agenda, such a strict position of Poland and Baltic states towards Russia and everything that has to do with Russia, doesn't matter if it's uh, pro-Putin or anti-Putin, how influential their position is and how long it will be the principal violin of this European orchestra. I don't think the position of these countries will change, but they will be adjusting to the situation. It's a principal position, and it stems from the history between our countries, and I think people know what I mean. Right now, uh, their position influences EU's position, but the Germans don't like it, the French don't like it, and the Italians don't like it. But in this case, the position of New Europe, which whose leader is Poland, this position is uh, matching the position of the US and the UK, and that makes it stronger. Further down the road, uh, it will be adapting to the situation, but this motive will remain. We need to understand that sooner or later, Russia's relation between the world and Russia will be better, but it will never earn trust. They'll, they'll trade, they'll have businesses, but trust will be hard, hardly earned. Because they will always have on the back of their head that you can't trust Russia. And there will be these countries in Ukraine. Not during our lifetime. No, no, no. During our lifetime. During our lifetime, we've seen so much, and we'll see even more. It's better to unsee it. Well, yes, you're right. It's better to unsee it. But sadly, we can't change anything. This week, I had Arkady Ostrovsky from The Economist, and I asked him this question, why Putin is still alive? Not, I mean, not physically, but as a political figure. Because it seems that everything plays against those things that brought him to power, everything that he was founded on. How would you explain it to yourself? Well, because the system he created, and he is the pivot of this system, and this system understands that if he leaves, there will be disintegration of the system. That's why they need to ensure gradual, smooth transition. Even for the strongest group, Silaviki, the security services, they, they are waiting for the power to come to their hands, and everything is going to this. Other groups don't want that, but all of them, they understand, no matter how they, no matter what their attitude to Putin is, whatever their perception of Putin is, but they know that this is his system, that this is Putin's regime. If there is no Putin, many things will be changed, and this brings a lot of risk. That's why they are interested in keeping status quo. Will we find out if Putin is gone? Knowing that we started with the body double, not right away. Uh, the body double will be uh, replacing the president for some time while uh, the power structure will be decided on. So why they need body doubles? Before they used them for security reasons, uh, when they had several motorcades, 
and uh, you couldn't tell in which one uh, there is a real president. And now they can use those body doubles for political reasons. I remember this uh, Sasha Baron Cohen film, Dictator. If you didn't see it, it's a pretty uh, rough comedy and quite cynical one. But certain things that they showed there, uh, you can look at them differently. Yes, I saw that film, yes. And actually there, uh, there is a story about a double. So we have a few minutes left and let's just remind people. So please like our video and please repost it. 42,000 people are watching us, that's great. Valery, again, finishing our conversation. You characterize the situation in Russia. We see what is the monolith of the elite in Russia. So what may happen and may be a signal uh, of uh, possibility of negotiations. In my view, now nothing. For this, Russia has to go through certain hardships and ordeals that may have to do with the situation in the war or use of the nuclear weapons so that the elites would have the desire to have negotiations and to be ready to work towards this direction without any preconditions. Right now we don't see that. Also I would like to put this question in such a way so that you, you didn't break any law. See, with the fact of my existence I am breaking the law. Crimea. Can Crimea be a subject of negotiations for Russian elites? Right now, no. But the thing is, if they say no now that Crimea cannot be discussed, it means that it can be discussed. As far as I know, all the consultations that they had before, uh, they said we can discuss anything but, the, but Crimea. Thank you very much. Valery Salavey was with us today. Thank you for being with us this morning, answering our questions. Frankly speaking, 73% of people who say that they agree with you that it's possible that they used the body double, I was actually surprised with this number because I thought it way too creepy. But, well, there is no nothing too creepy in Russia anymore. Not so much is left, you know. That big press conference where I asked Putin a question, was it Putin there or not? No, no, it was Putin, no doubt about that. So, yeah, you were lucky, you saw real Putin. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, all the best to everyone, thank you for watching, liking us, please support us uh, through that website and through this QR code that you can see on the screen. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye-bye.